writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, David Allen Lucas, author of various things. And I have a running story right now on Tumblr. You can go to my website to click to it. And just it's out there for fun. It's called Skittles. It's a, all about a cat going to Mars. And the theme song today you heard a moment ago is Hitchcock Presents. Because today we're going to talk about tightening tension in our stories. With me today is... Kathleen Cayembe. I write paranormal romance as Kaseka and Vita, and I'm tickled because I had never heard that intro before. Oh. Hmm. I'm Melanie Kulani. Um, I write uh, sci-fi, fantasy, and nonfiction. And uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, I my, the sci-fi that I'm not currently working on. Yeah, it could be a sci- would be a sci-fi thriller. So this mm-hmm. would be good talk for me to have. Yeah. I'm Fedora Amos. I write Victorian whodunits like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis, and I am president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. I'm Meredith Tate, author of Speculative YA and New Adult. Um, My first novel, Missing Pieces, comes out on March 3rd, so if you're interested in Speculative New Adult, you should check it out. I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I'm trying to publish a fantasy novel, write YA. Uh, I'm excited about tension. (laughs) <laughs> uh, Brad R. Cook. Uh, I write uh, mostly all kinds of historical fantasy and stuff. My n- novel, uh, Iron Horseman, is currently out. Okay, so tightening tension. What is tension in the story? Let's just start off with, let's go basic. Hmm. And let's build from there. Well, I think that tension is a really kind of simple concept that is... Some character, somebody, someone wants something. Hmm. And that something is hard to get. The harder to get, the quicker you have to get it, the more important it is to you, the more tension is arrived from that, the more Hmm. agitation. You brought up obstacles and time already. Already. Mm -hmm. I would describe tension as anticipation. I mean, it's not quite a synonym. They're not quite synonyms in this context, but for the reader, the reader is anticipating something happening. They might be fearing it happening, they might be waiting for it anxiously, whatever, Mm -hmm. but they're anticipating it. To borrow from Alfred Hitchcock, which I just played the theme song to it. The master of tension. (laughs) Yeah, the master of tension, the master of suspense. The object, and I'm just borrowing him, and correct me, Fedora and everybody else, if you think I go off base with mm-hmm. this idea as we talk about tension, mm-hmm. is the object of what the character wants really doesn't matter. It's as long a, as it's important to right, that character. As long as it's important to that character. It's a MacGuffin. Pray for the MacGuffin. If I, if I remember mm-hmm. pronunciation that, correctly. That is correct. Now, for those but, of us that haven't been listening to every episode, what is a MacGuffin? A MacGuffin is something that basically the characters want... It's something which the characters have to get, and the audience really don't care about the object itself. They care about the obtaining of the object. I heard it described once as the thing with the most muchness. Yes. I call it the thing with the most thingness. The same thing with the most thingness? (laughs) Yeah. I'm sure it could be the object with the most objectness as well. (laughs) Yeah. See, I've never understood that term before, so thank you guys for explaining it. (laughs) Me too. Succinctly. Let me try some examples. As a character wants something, everybody wants something. The police want to catch the bad guys. The boy wants to get the girl. Mm -hmm. The famous actress wants to get another plastic surgery. (laughs) (laughs) But then what happens? The police can't get the bad guys because the bad guys, Bob, bless him, 
are off running away from the police. <laughs> The boy can't get the girl. Well, maybe he could, but he discovers that she is a vampire from another planet who sees him as lunch. (laughs) And as for the famous actress, her doctors tell her that if she has one more facelift, she's going to look like Elephant Man. (laughs) So you see, there has to be (laughs) obstacle in the way. The more obstacles, the bigger the obstacles, the more tension. I would describe one more type of tension that could be very big. There is a ticking bomb that the reader knows about that's under this table. Mm. The people, we all sitting at the table, don't know there's a bomb there. The reader knows the bomb is ticking down. The reader is getting a lot of tension, but we at the table don't have it. That's That's another Hitchcockian. I was going to say, the bus can't go below 55 miles. Like a rope. There's a body under the coffee table. Yes, I I I love that. A shotgun over the fireplace. (laughs) (laughs) Or even how about, um, oh, was it Notorious? Am I thinking of the right one where the woman who is a daughter of a farmer German um, ends up marrying into it being assigned to marry into a what we would nowadays call a neo-nazi family because they want to bring back the reich and they have got some type of nuclear bomb thing that they have to get (laughs) get, get that's mcguffin was to get back and she gets poisoned I, i think you're on the right track there every spy thriller for example we have knowledge that the spy has, that the reader has, and then nobody has, and all of those create tension. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, secrets are a great way to build tension. So, are we going to focus on one kind of tension at a time or go back and forth? Because it sounds to me that there is the tension built into the story through obstacles like time and other characters and, you know, mm-hmm. nature, I don't know. <laughs> and there's also the tension of the reader knows something, the audience knows something, the characters don't know, and it's going to be a problem. Well, I'm going to answer that question with another question. Is there a difference between tension and stakes? You raise the stakes of a story, is that raising the tension of a story? Or are those Usually, different Usually, but not always. I think they're interrelated. <laughs> yeah. Can we go into stakes a little bit? Well... Yeah, we can. But before I do, let me just go toss out one last little thing. Oh and then let's talk about stakes. <laughs> and that is something which Alfred Hitchcock used to always say, or did say. You don't have... Shooting somebody... I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing him. I'm not, I don't have his quote right in front of me. Mm-hmm. Shooting somebody on screen is not scary. Showing the gun getting ready to shoot the character is what's scary. Is what builds suspense. Go back and watch the movie Psycho. Famous shower scene. Count the no- Actually, I have this on a blog, too, about writing Hitchcockian. Count the number of times you actually see the knife enter into the victim in the shower scene. The answer is zero. I would like to point out one more thing, though. Uh, you're right, shooting someone, mm-hmm. seeing someone shot isn't scary, except... When your main character is standing next to the person that shot, but then that, that then that loses still loses attention of that other person being shot. No, but that's what I mean. It's like there's a sniper out there. We don't know where the gun is. Someone was just shot. There's a gun somewhere. That's pretty. The, his, yeah. well, that's uh, how you discover the seeing gun someone is, get shot is scary when we care about that person. Right, and, and that's what the difference the is. Next it's to like, them. Yeah, yeah, we care about the character. We're next worried to them too. about. If there's a stranger on the street and they get shot, that's not scary. But there's a stranger on the scene and we just found out that that was our character's beloved nephew, then we're upset. Well, no, but... Okay, but but you're, stranger... not focus, you're, you're, you're going off on... I understand what you're saying and I agree with you, but I'm just saying the actual tension builder is the presence of the gun but if, before it shoots. But if, if the person next to me gets shot and, they, and there's reason to believe they were really aiming for me and missed, now that's very suspenseful. <laughs> well, I'd like to bring up while we're on the subject of shooters. Something that happened uh, years ago, there was a sniper shooting what seemed to be random people. The DC sniper? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew who it was, Mm -hmm. what their motive for doing these things were, was, and where they were going next. Right. And everybody was terrified that they were next. It... That's kind of the scenario I was describing, only in a more immediate way than the nebulous real life everyone. example. Yeah. yeah. Well, you could do it with the 
bombing the, the mail bomber and all that. Unabomber. Event, Unabomber and all that, but well, I'm going to let you go next. But you were right. You were right about your question earlier. And I, we've, we've suddenly, I ended up derailing it. didn't think I would. <laughs> and that was, um, or maybe it was Spirits, Jen. I'm sorry. Raising the stakes. Yeah. Yes. And so forth. I think it depends on the genre, and every genre has a different type of tension. Um, I think for me, an example of a very um, tension... Uh, tense scene, I guess, is the movie Charade. It's kind of an old... I love, oh, Charade. I love Charade. I love Charade. And there's a scene near the end, and I haven't seen this movie in a few years, so correct me if I get it wrong, but um, the the guy has a gun, and he's on top of a stage. And then we have our hero, and he's below the stage, and we hear the footsteps. Am I right? I'm trying yes. to remember it. Okay. Yeah, stage. And we hear the footsteps of the shooter... And they're very slow, and he's just kind of walking across the stage. And we know our hero is beneath the stage, and the shooter knows that the hero is there, but doesn't know where. And I, to me, that scene just, like, shot my heart rate up so much. Because we knew that they were there. We knew they were going to have a confrontation, but they didn't mm-hmm. know where each other was. And that really scared me. Well, in that, the uh, the heroine is stuck there in yeah. a little cube <laughs> cage. Mm-hmm. and. The bad guy is going together, and of course the hero is downstairs trying to find the right lever to pull yep. <laughs> to let the trap yep uh-huh. and fall so down that's and get the guy. He's listening the for the footsteps yeah. to so, see if yeah. he can hear where right. he is before he gets to the the that's girl. Yes. And that scene just a great for me, great example of tension. What a good movie. Mm-hmm. What's it about for those of us who haven't seen it? Because I haven't. Oh. Charade. It's a it's a game of identities. Charade with lots of great twists. Lots uh, of so dramas. is it a spy thriller? Or is it a no? It's a uh, it's a drama. I'd call it a drama. Well, it it is a, a suspense. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it's a suspense. I wouldn't quite call it a spy thriller, but definitely is a cr- crime suspense and does have the elements of a spy thriller and a it's fantastic a cast. Oh yeah, <laughs> and even the remake wasn't too bad. I don't think I've seen the remake. All right, so we've brought up a couple things. The mm-hmm. word suspense just came up. Yes. And I was like, oh my goodness, right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, tension, anticipation, suspense, mm-hmm. in story or between audience and material. Mm-hmm. What is the relationship between all of these things? Because I don't think they're the same, necessarily. And they're not all what you're using as a writer. And let me also add to that, as I said before... Every story has its different form of tension. Every story has its own form of suspense. Suspense and suspense stories is going to be different than suspense in romance stories. I really want to hear Fedora talk about this. I do. (laughs) I really do. I'm going to let Fedora go first. Go for it. Well, we talk about romance later. But right now I want to talk about what you were saying about the gun and the shot and why the gun is more suspenseful than the shot. Why the shadow of the gun is probably more suspenseful than the gun itself. And what we're getting around to here, I think, is something called gray space. Gray space. That is, often it's not what you say, it's what you leave unsaid for the reader to plug in to his or her own mind. Mm-hmm. So that often the best thing you can do is back off and say practically nothing. Mm-hmm. And if you look at some of the best movies of the day, that's exactly what it is. You get half pictures, half tones, you get shadows, you get all kinds of stuff. And that is much more tension-filled than to get the plain old Technicolor picture of it. Real quick before you. Let me, let me bring this to a non-writing reality. If you ever go on a camp, go to a, go camping, and you're sitting in the dark, especially if you're new. I'm looking over at Brad because I know he and I both got backgrounds there. Are you afraid of the dark? No, not at all. No. But if you're out in the woods and you hear, you hear <laughs> wolves cry, you hear Ooh, other sounds, you hear crunching of leaves, and you can't see anything. Something's sniffing outside the tent. Mm-hmm. There, you start to feel a certain suspense, unless you're really comfortable in the woods. If you're really brand new to the area, you're going to feel a certain level of suspense. It's the same thing. A not uh, camping <laughs> example, but something mm-hmm. that all of us Midwesterners know. When you're sitting inside and you suddenly hear the whine of a tornado siren. Exactly. It just cr- it ramps up and you're wondering, is that this county or the county over? And it's not I so much know. the <laughs> event that's causing you to fear. Going back to what Fedora was saying... What you're leaving out is a writer 
It's allowing the imagination of the reader or imagination of the person well, who's entering it. I'm terrified of tornadoes because tornadoes strike suddenly mm-hmm. and they hit Corpily. very small yes. yeah. por- you know, portions. Yeah. Do you think at? you're safe in the city? One hit St. Louis, mm-hmm. Good Friday, in the middle of a, of a busy suburban right. shopping area. Yeah, was, I um, once accidentally... I will say it's accidentally. You accidentally got hit by a tornado? No. I accidentally, <laughs> I accidentally walked three-fourths of a mile outside to from home to work during a tornado warning. Not a watch, a warning. Uh, After one that, was on I, the ground. Yeah, but at least it wasn't right near me. It was a whole... It was in uh, City, in fact. Ah, so, you know, it was yeah, kind of that's right. away. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that reminds me of lectures I've received because you said I walked... I was a half a mile? Half a mile in a... And I was, like, immediately uphill... With no, no shoes, shoes to school okay. in the snow, Barefoot, and then but beating off bears with my spiral notebook. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, receiving a lecture is fraught with tension for me because I don't like when people are mad, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know something bad is coming. I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop, and that's a huge and point that, of tension. Yes. That, as writers, I think is what we tie into. It's not into the fears and emotion, and that's what you're trying to tap into. Is that emotion? and the emotions surrounding that fear to raise the suspense in the reader. No. That's my thoughts. Yeah. Right now, I am writing a fantasy novel. And so far, in this fantasy novel, this is a first draft, so building tension will be, you know, second, third draft, whatever. Mm-hmm. But the point is, I've had an attempted kidnapping of a couple of the main characters' nieces. So now, they're actually doing normal stuff with the nieces, so my job for building the tension will be to have describe things, describe ordinary things, and have the reader or ha- basically convey the tension. Ordinary things. Is this normal or is this some um, bad guy so- is something about to happen? To me, a huge source of tension, and I think it was brought up with the, the bomb under the table ticking down, is right. kind of when you know there's this imminent kind of time frame. Mm-hmm. Like, um, even though it's not really a suspenseful story, but think about Cinderella. Like, the whole time you're counting down to midnight, because you know what midnight that's our last chance, and it's kind of like anytime something's counting down. To me, that's a huge mm-hmm. source of tension. Look at look at the look at the TV show that lasted six, maybe seven seasons. Twenty four. Yep. If you count yeah. on twenty four, you always had that tick 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 going. Brett, I was going to say it seems like everything we're talking about tension is directly related to the manipulation of people's anxiety. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, so you're re- you know, manipulating both the character's anxiety, the reader's anxiety, and everything else to but build. But they tension. like it. The reader, not the characters. Yes. Most yeah. of the time, we, we, on what we I'm like reading. tension yeah. in our lives that we don't actually have to live through. Safe tension. There's Safe tension. Vicarious. Vicarious. There's, there's, there's still like. Thank you. There's still like good tension and bad tension. There are types of stories that I don't like to read or watch because they mm-hmm. make me too anxious mm-hmm. and I don't like it. Sure. I usually avoid high school dramas for that reason. <laughs> Brings back too many bad memories of people talking behind people's backs, and you know oh. it's going to explode in their face, and one person is dating another person, and I can't take it, I turn it off. I can't watch Downton Abbey anymore. <laughs> Officially, I wish I could just skip high school myself without the <laughs> period. But anyway, yes. You're right. Speaking of high school, ha ha ha, everything in high school seemed huge to me. Mm-hmm. Like, Everything was a big deal. Well, they made a big deal out of everything. This test <laughs> score could ruin you. Teenagers <laughs> make a big deal out of everything. That's the nature of being a teenager. Teenager. Okay, as somebody who writes YA and loves like that whole high school angsty stuff, um, that's the whole point of it, is that these people are living their lives for the first time. So everything's new and huge. And on that note, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will finally get a sentence out. Sorry. Please. Again, it's okay. No. The stakes are huge in high school because mm-hmm. that's what everyone is telling you. And I want to talk about stakes mm-hmm. because we've talked about how we inspire tension between characters and everything, but stakes is a huge part of that. Very much so. So, how do you raise the stakes in a story? We've mentioned time. Any obstacle, and the bigger the better. Especially for tension is concerned. Especially if you build. Gradually. They clear one obstacle, and now you get a bigger obstacle. They've got clear and a bigger obstacle, or mm-hmm. something. Clearing the obstacle suddenly triggered another one that's going to plop right in their face. Is it a good idea to Evil use Deus, stepmothers. Deus Ex Machina's to fix the obstacles for everybody? No. No. Well. Are you thinking of a specific example, Kevin? Unless you're Steven Spielberg, George Things Lucas, <laughs> and you're writing Indiana Jones, I would say generally no. No, I I was reading a book and it had the best use of I can never say that word, but Deus, Deus Ex, Ex Machina. Thank you. 
God's come in and saved the day. It had the best use of it whatsoever. I mean, God was a character of it, and he actually talked to the person. It just was great, but uh, it was the Alloy of Laws, the name of the book, and I forget the name of the author, Jordan hmm. something or another. Do I need to explain Deus Ex Machina before we go on? Well, she Probably. Just, she kind of did by trying not to pronounce it. God is in the machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically, a higher power comes in and solves your problem for you. It comes from the Greek, basically something. It doesn't yeah. necessarily need to be a higher power, but it needs to be something. That a just greater power. comes out of nowhere and solves your it's problem. Like, and right. suddenly everything was fixed the end. And Coincidence. And she found <laughs> out she was a princess. A and a big red me. reset button. Yes. Yeah, so. yes. Sorry, Fedora. Still looking for this button in life. <laughs> <laughs> it's called <called> Staples. Staples. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget that some of the best sources <laughs> of tension come not from outside anywhere, though of course yeah. those are all excellent, but some of the very best ones come from inside. Yeah, they are definitely. emotional, they are fears that you cannot accomplish something, or that you are unlovable. There are so many possibilities for internal tension. Internal tension is that huge. is That you can't overlook it, you definitely shouldn't overlook it, I think, in writing. Building right to, I'm glad you brought that up, thank you. One of the great, one of the things about suspense, one of the great things about tension is it has to come from within the character or within the mind. And it can be co totally imaginary. Yeah, it can be completely. Your imagination is the greatest tension builder there is. I'm going to say, in romance, uh, <laughs> internal tension is great. It makes you want to hit people in the face, but it's great. It drives me up a wall. <laughs> well, misunderstandings are stupid, and I don't like them at oh, all in no. stories. That's like the reverse of a deus ex machina. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> Poor storytelling. But yeah. internal Cheating. tension, yeah. like the characters thinking they're unlovable or completely misreading signs, mm -hmm. because that happens. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. kind of borders on a miscommunication at some point. <laughs> okay, how about the character who sees himself as unre unredeemable? Mm -hmm. We love there. them. Or self-destructive. Antiheroes. Mm -hmm. Or, um, I was, we have, Jen and I have a friend who loves Tony Stark very, very much. She loves him best when he's at his worst. <laughs> yeah, but like he would be the perfect example of a character who does great things but thinks they're worthless. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that causes tension when you're like, oh, well, is he going to do something utterly stupid and get himself killed because he thinks he's not worth as much as these other people? Or will he maybe think things through? Choose different things to do. Well, uh, Kathleen, since you brought it up, I think it's time to wade right in and talk to everybody's favorite sexual tension. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Kick uh, back and read <laughs> listeners, <laughs> grab your notebooks. I'm feeling fine. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I don't know what that sound was. Anyway. <laughs> well, it was singing. <laughs> it is the romance writer's stock in trade. Every good romance it's all about sexual tension. It's not just about humping one another. Okay? <laughs> US that's so that's erotica. A that's the difference between the two. <laughs> yes. UST, unresolved sexual tension. Remember this acronym. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And often, once again, that is about what doesn't happen instead of what does. Because what does, well, there you got porn or erotica. <laughs> it's what doesn't happen. I will say, for instance, on the X-Files, they use this successfully for seasons. Yeah, see, there's the, I think we can go, if we go TV series, it's a great place to go to help uh, explain your, your point, Fedora. How many shows have used te sexual tension to continue? And then the minute that the two hook up, it's the last season. Was it Bones like that? <laughs> no, Bones kept going. And oh. Castle kept going. But yeah, it's some, so some can do so it well. Yeah. They can as long as they're also invested. Like, if they build good characters, then Running you want to see steal. how their relationship yeah. goes. <laughs> Versus, you know... Season. There are, I'm not going to name any names, I'm not going to be mean, but there are several shows I've watched that you're like, oh, now it's done. Oh. We're over. Yeah. Okay. To me, a huge example of what Jim was just mentioning <laughs> is um, Jim and Pam in The Office, and I loved their role. Like, they both obviously liked each other, but, like, it just, they were, she was engaged to Roy, and it just wasn't working out, and, like, the whole first few seasons is about their friendship, and it was so cute, and you just want them to get together so bad, and then season four, they start dating, and honestly, to me, it was a little bit like, oh, okay, like, that's where that went, and then they got married, <laughs> and I was kind of like, okay... Like, I'm really happy they got together, but at the same time, like, that whole element of the show kind of was gone. The tension was gone. The tension was gone. So, exactly. to me, it was kind of like, like, I still find them adorable, but it was still kind of like, oh, okay. Soap that operas. Sexual tensions are stock and trade. That's Not why. Just sexual. Soap operas, oh, well, like, yeah. literally live on tension. So, you have the, 
the person with the gun. Who shot who? You don't know. You didn't get to see them. <laughs> oh, was it, you know, no. <laughs> Pregnant pauses. Yes. Hearing and see in general. Yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah, they, 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 their entire stock and trade is on tension. I mm-hmm. loved you until I got my memories back and realized you were my brother, and that's creepy. <laughs> but how will I live like this? I must thank, go. Thank you, Leah and Luke. <laughs> yeah, and then two seasons later, they're hooked up again, and, you know, that whole storyline's forgotten about. Because now they're not siblings. Yeah. It was all fake because exactly. the princess. I don't know. I have what I think is a really good example. It comes from last week's NCIS Los Angeles. Oh. Two of the characters are computer geeks. They are Nell Jones and Eric Beale. Granger calls them the Murcats from the second story. Mm-hmm. They are researching a fellow to find out what was in his past, so they look through his financial records and the like, and find out that he'd been spending a lot of money on women's clothes and jewelry and that sort of thing. And Nell said, hmm, that's very interesting. And Eric said, oh, yes, it's certainly interesting that he spends $800 for a pair of panties at La Perla. Hmm. Nell said, they don't cost $800. Eric said, how do you know that, Miss Jones? And she said, how do you think I know it, (laughs) Mr. (laughs) Beale? It's what you don't say that is left unknown and intriguing that makes it sexual tension. And that's a very brief scene, but it's very key and very memorable. So that scene seems to have suggested some things that was were then left up to audience imagination. Mm-hmm. And you got to fill in your own blanks, and it was better for that. How would it have been different if she had spelled out how she knew, though? Like, I or even if she them. just said, La Perla panties only cost between 100 and $150. That is not as good, is it? It would have been more... How do you it's more it? matter-of-fact and Boring. not intriguing. <laughs> That's just better writing. That's taking a <laughs> sentence and, you know, it's taking a line of dialogue delivered and using it for more than one purpose. If the line of dialogue was only there to refute how much panties cost, then the second one would have done just fine. The dialogue was not only there to do that, it was there to do that and also communicate something about her, the characters and how they relate to each other. Which, right. of course, registered on Eric's face. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Tension is to help the readers move forward in the story, help them keep turning pages or watching. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It is to intrigue, now, to pull them forward. I was just thinking, a comedy also plays into this. Tension and comedy both rely on timing and reactions. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking of one of the Star Trek movies, and I forget which one it was. It was one of the next-gen movies. But if you have um, any details, I can name it for you. <laughs> it was the one where Jordy got his <laughs> Jordy got his eyesight back because of the magical rays. first contact. Yeah. No, no magical no. rays. That was uh, insurrection. There yeah, insurrection. <gasps> but the point is, there was he got one. The, he got the yeah. eye implant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, first contact. Uh, uh, data overheard. Troy and Crusher, Dr. Crusher making a stupid comment that uh. they never would have made. Then he repeated it to Worf, something about uh, making the magical rays making their boobs yeah. puffier or something. Puffier. <laughs> <laughs> puffier. 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 Puffier.
They explode. He sets this off, and of course CIA guys are like, oh, we're in a gunfight, and they start shooting up the boss's house. He escapes when nobody's looking. That sounds like a very MacGyverism. It was very MacGyver. <laughs> and another MacGyverism, and actually this is one I was originally going to tell. He gets picked up by the cops. Walter Matthau. And he is stuck. He they, they're, This is before being able to sit there on a computer and run somebody's um, information. He is, um, they're on the phone, they're checking up on this guy, and Walter Matthau's like, well, okay, I'm playing it cool, but how do I get out of here? He grabs a paper clip. He unplugs something, puts the paper clip on the plug, and replugs it back in, closing the circuit, and of course, causing the electricity to go out and runs. But you're watching this whole thing like, how is he going to get out of this? It's a really simple answer. But anyway, the whole timing of what he does and the jokes behind it is a comedy and also builds suspense. You have a look on your face. You being me, being Kathleen. Yes. The star in radio format. <laughs> I'm trying to think about how... Well, for one, MacGyverism is a term I've not heard before, but I, I get it. It's cute. <laughs> um, it's from the TV show MacGyver. He made everything out of nothing. Oh, yeah. Right. An atomic bomb out of a piece of tin foil. <laughs> <laughs> <It's really laughs> right. Exactly. Helicopter out of a rubber band and a paper clip. Yeah. You got one? We can go do it. <laughs> plain ones. You didn't yeah. make a plain one. Oh, my ones. goodness. Out of trash bags. Episode. And uh, mm. I forget what else. Scotch tape. I don't yeah, know. He, he, he was one of those that made science cool. Yeah. But I think these are all helpful, but I think we should talk about more specific examples of good tension versus bad tension. Well, I, I like about, that. Let's do that. Okay. Oh. I was going to say, and add to that, how, how that tension is done. How, as a mecha- mechanical aspect of it, how do you tighten the tension? You can get into that. Uh, I'll start. Mystery writers often use red herrings to do accomplish that, which is, of course, a clue as to what's going to happen later, but it's a false clue. Mm -hmm. And uh, most mystery writers I know go back and put these in deliberately so that uh, the readers will be misled to some extent and will go off in the wrong direction. And that, of course, creates tension because then they're confused and don't know which is going to happen and they want to know. I'd also say if you're going to try and put tension in uh, the pacing of your story, so Mm -hmm. you're going to want shorter sentences, you're going to want, you know, that quick staccato kind of look to the page. And the reason you're doing that... Late in the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the the reason I say that is because you're going to want that that quickness to that scene. It doesn't mean whatever scene you're doing it in, that quickness will build up tension towards whatever you're doing as opposed to a long, drawn-out paragraph. Mm Mm-hmm. You'll notice, you'll notice, I'm glad you brought that up, Brad, because you'll notice if you're reading a book that is where that suspense is happening, you will notice sentences get a lot shorter, and yet it's like it slows down time there, and you're like, oh, God, I want to get to the end of this. I want to know what happened. Yeah. yeah I thought you no, had to up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, a different type of way to build tension is maintaining audience and uh, expectations of what's going to happen. So... Um, foreshadowing can do this in a book, but I was just thinking of the example in Jaws. During the first shark attack, there was that da 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 <laughs> da mm-hmm. right before the shark attacked. That trained the audience. Then, whenever the audience heard that movie, they knew the shark was there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then, at the end, when the shark attacks, it does so without the sound effect, and therefore takes everyone off guard. <laughs> yes. They used that on purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I'd actually throw out there if you're really looking for tension and kind of stuff. Uh, never letting the audience know what's about to happen. And the mm-hmm. person who does this brilliantly is George R. R. Martin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he has spent several books and several seasons of TV shows uh, ensuring that we don't have a comfortable, any kind of comfort level with any character. That anyone can die at any moment, anything can shift and go crazy, and that level of tension means that the moment somebody enters a room, you're like, oh my god, are they going to die? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just it's it kind of has gotten to that point where you know some character enters and you're just like, oh, you know, how's this going to end? So yeah, I agree. Like if I'm if I'm watching Star Trek, and it's one of the main characters, unless it's the final episode of a season, or if I know the actor wants to leave, whatever, no matter how bad the off, I mean, Worf died in that episode. It's like okay. Let's see, when does he come back to life? Because, you know, it's the middle of the season. He's not going to stay dead. (laughs) 
but you can still build... There are plenty of episodes of Star Trek that were very tense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But I wasn't really afraid of them dying. (laughs) No, but you're afraid of the consequences. Yeah. And that being able to build that kind of attention, that sort of care has to do with how you craft your characters and how you craft Mm -hmm. your world. You want to talk about an example of tension, of there not being any tension. There are plenty of shows that don't spend any time developing individual characters enough that we care about little stuff in their lives. Mm-hmm. Like, if we're st- talking about Star Trek already, what if there was an episode in which Data's cat was in danger? We would all be very tense. <laughs> because not only do we feel bad about cats, but we know that that cat is the closest thing Data has to something that he loves. And he's a robot, and he's learning how to love, and we know that if, we lo- if he loses that, he will have to go through something that will hurt as much as he can possibly manage that. So that, they, they gave us a scenario in which we already care about the stakes. We oh, care about the tension. That, you know, it works. That reminds me of a Voyager episode where I saw a bit character getting way too many lines. Like, oh, I like that character. Too bad she's <laughs> going to die. Oh, suddenly I'm thinking of The Walking Dead. I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got three hands up, so two hands up. Consequences. Mm. Something that I don't think we've brought up yet. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about the Seinfeld reset, where at the end of every episode, everything goes back to where the last episode was when it started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something sitcoms don't have consequences to the extent that other shows that are more dramas do. And because of that, I'm less worried about sitcom characters than I would be about, say, Wu dying in, um, in Grimm or something like that. I haven't seen season three. If anything happens to him, I'm going to cry, but don't tell me. I haven't seen any Grimm except for a couple episodes. It gives me joy. Two episodes. Um, something that Grimm does to help with tension, too, is that the main character can see the fairy tale creature inside of certain people. Mm-hmm. Nobody else can see this. So often when you meet someone for the first time, you're wondering, is this one of them or is this a harmless person? Will this person grow giant teeth and be trying to chomp on his throat? Or are they benign? You don't know. I think we're, we're running around one issue here, mm-hmm. which is sets of expectations for different genres of literature. Most of yes. That is that readers have one kind of expectation if it's a mystery, a different if it's comic, and a different one altogether if it's science fiction. So that, as you said, Melanie... We don't care if the characters die, they'll probably come back. And that's yeah. true for time travel and science fiction and lots of other things. Yeah, Comics. some. It, <clears throat> there's science fiction where people can die. <laughs> so, it depends on the tone of your show that you yes. yes. Right. Exactly. In your book. Yeah. And now I lost my train of thought. Well, <laughs> expectations for different genres. So, yeah, if you're writing mur- still, murder oh, mystery, you're, anything but the detective, back anybody back but the detective You're building the die. tension in me, Fedora. Will you come up with that idea again? <laughs> Will she come up with it before well, the episode ends? I oh, my don't gosh. Know. There's a ticking clock. Let me think about it. <laughs> no pressure. Dun, There's no pressure dun, dun, on you right dun, now to think dun, it up. And what if somebody else says dun, something dun, dun, and it jogs her dun. thought, but then we still run out of time? What if it's really important? Well, then it, it'll just have to be unsaid. An unfired bomb under the table? You got it. Go ahead. I think that kind of what Fedora was saying and also kind of what Kathleen was saying about um, the audience and different genres. Like, for example, when I watch a sitcom, I don't really want to be, like, traumatized. I don't want to <laughs> exactly. cry. I just want to yeah, sit and right. relax and laugh. So I think that What's if... What's going to happen to Homer Simpson yeah. next? <laughs> exactly. So, like, if the Something sitcom really ended really with, like, a brutal death or something like that, I would be very uncomfortable. Cause that's not what I want when I turn on a sitcom. Whereas... If I'm watching Game of Thrones, I'm mentally preparing myself for what's going to happen. And I feel like that's, like, I'm all for breaking rules, but I think, in terms of writing, but I think that that's a a kind of a rule that you should kind of stay with in terms of those types of conventions of what's expected by the reader. Following the contract, there will be less. Yes. (laughs) No, I was just going to say that. Oh, (laughs) there is is a reader contract or audience contract. If Mm -hmm. these people have signed up for whatever you're writing, chances are they know at least a little bit about what the usual expectations are for that, and they're prepared for those things. Mm -hmm. Don't switch genres on them in the middle without very good reason. I've seen that happen. Go ahead. Another, to me, a a show that I love that I feel like has so much tension, even though it's predictable, is The Twilight Zone, 
because every episode ends in a twist, every single one. So every time I watch it, I'm worried the entire time. What's the twist? What's going to happen? Even though we know what's going to happen, we know there's going to be a twist. We don't know what it is. And to me, I can never guess them. And that and, always leaves me And unsettled. the Twilight Zone is <laughs> short stories. So anything could happen to those characters because next week yeah. it's a whole new story. True. Sure. How does that differ from M. Night Shyamalan films, which are notorious for the twists that always come at Good the end? twist versus bad twist? <laughs> Should that be another topic altogether? Or can we, or would that twist. just be us complaining about M. Night Shyamalan all the whole time? And, and to be honest, M. Night, you know, he did do some things. He did, you know, very much say that there were dead people. Uh, we did not realize there were dead people before then. You know, I, you know, I should say we didn't realize one person was dead. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, that was the good movie. Yeah, yeah that was good. <laughs> you know, versus it, it's plants, or it's the you know, it's it's not really ancient times. It's, yeah. it's modern day. I want to talk about a specific genre, um, horror. It's anybody's good. I think horror is good at ratcheting up tension. But then I was also thinking about slasher fix, slasher fix, which is the slasher flicks, which um, have a lot of stabby <laughs> things in them, and I'm. When I watch those, I'm like, okay, you're going to die. You're going to die. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of concerned maybe you're going to live. That's a little tension. But mostly I'm just expecting a knife to come out and mm. my stomach to feel well, awful. Well, and to that point, it, you know, we were talking earlier about not seeing the gun go, or, you know, not seeing the person get shot or stabbed or something is tension. But the reality is, is like the o- uber gore fest can be, you know, can have that, elicit that same response, which is one of the reasons why we have it so much now. Yeah, I mean, you can look back at any of the Hitchcockian movies or any of the movies from the 50s and 60s, and anyone who goes and sees them today would be like, this is boring. You know, and that's an audience contract thing. You know, because we're used to now seeing the bullet, the gunshot, the stabbing, or whatever. And to be honest, we're to the point now where that's in an everyday life occurrence. Mm-hmm. So the the threat of tension, you know, that, that, that sense of tension isn't there because, to be perfectly honest who hasn't seen a gun go off, who hasn't seen somebody get stabbed, who hasn't seen something super gory, mm-hmm. you know. I, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, Brad, but I disagree a little bit, too. Is, for me, anyway, when I see a slasher film, it's the emotion that's going for is gore. And I don't think gore is an emotion. I don't know, yeah, it's not an emotion. It, the, it's, the reaction to gore. <laughs> So, disgust. Disgust. <laughs> Not everyone feels disgust. But it's that same but... sense of stirring the emotions. Yeah. I mean, okay. Psycho, Psycho worked because it it blew everyone out of the water. No one had yeah. ever seen anything like that before. Mm-hmm. No they one had ever been... on pump. Yes, mm-hmm. no one had ever been taken on that ride before. But now we've gone on that ride. We've gone on the rides for 20-something years, and now we're to a ride that that's no... That, you know, that, that sense of not showing it is no longer as tension-filled as showing it. Well, a perfect example, not to go back to one of my favorite topics, but the Aliens franchise. Yes! The first Alien movie was completely unprecedented. Yes. Because at that point, all of the sci-fi movies that came out were fun, goofy, uh, like, jaunty movies. Like, you know, Forbidden Planet and what have you. And then a, mo- a sci-fi movie comes out that's treated as a horror film. Yep. And th- when the chest burster comes out, people were passing out because they were not, they weren't prepared, they were scared, they were disgusted. Uh, but you couldn't do that twice. Like, that movie yeah. itself is perfect, but you can't do that twice. Well, The Exorcist did the same thing. I don't know. Well, the second, I think the second one is well, even the, better. The second <laughs> one, I like the second one better because it's a different kind of film. Yes. Uh, James Space Cameron Wars. realized he needed to take it in a different direction. If they just made Alien again, it wouldn't have had the same impact. Instead, we had an action movie with the aliens in it, and we were able to... Uh, explore the aliens more, and the suspense was not from the creeping dread that we don't know what they are. The suspense was, well, there's so many of them, they're overpowering us, and we're so small, and we're, dist- mm-hmm. we're stranded. The third one then went a completely different direction. Let's uh, not talk about the third one. We won't talk about the <laughs> By the time we get around to uh, the fourth one, which is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's, not the title, by the way. <laughs> yeah. By the time we get around to the fourth one, we know so much about the aliens that mm-hmm. the, that movie is considered schlock. I mean, it's boring because well, it's the, not trying the only to real do anything that comes new. Out of that is who's controlling everything, and we find out that it's the well, it's like the guy who inspired the androids. Who's like <laughs> we kind of like 
the in the fourth one we didn't take a chance to invest in any of the characters because they were a buffet line. We knew that people were just there to get eaten by aliens. And Sigourney Weaver is here. She's probably important. Let's pay attention to her. Everyone else will just count them as they go down. Take a shot every time someone dies to aliens. Um, Good drinking game. Then let's go to Prometheus. Mm -hmm. Prometheus, Ridley Scott tried to recapture Alien 1, but he couldn't do it because we've already seen Alien 1. Well, that and his characters were acting very stupid, but that's another <laughs> issue. <laughs> I have a lot of issues with Prometheus as well. Yeah. But the goal was to try and go back to the alien thing. Right. And there's a video game that just came out, uh, Alien Isolation, that tried desperately to recapture the first, um, the first movie atmosphere. And I say that it did a pretty good job for the first half of it anyway, until okay. you started getting, yeah. until it became uh, character versus androids as opposed yeah. to character versus alien, once you learned all the alien tricks. Same thing. We get introduced to it because at this point we've gotten used to the Alien franchi franchise being like Alien vs. Predator, where all it is is big fight scenes and, and guns and stuff. So having to sneak around and avoid one alien that could kill you, that aid, that ramped up tension because now we aren't, weren't doing what we were used to doing. We're used to being heavily armed and shooting aliens no, to death as minute. opposed Bring to sneaking around. Bring it back around. to the topic. We're doing something that we're not expecting. That ratchets up tension. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know what, Jenna? Who's first? Um... Well, I think you brought up a very good point with the Aliens franchise and the differences between the movies being that the director recognized that what the audience expected was different mm -hmm. and then using that to their adva advantage to make the movie to better. And success or not success, depending on which yes. one of the movies we're talking about. Changing where the stakes were being raised. Mm -hmm. But they had to change it every single time. If they'd done the same thing, then that wouldn't have been the, that's not the approach they needed to take. To that's, keep a franchise going. That's important to think about as writers. If you're writing a series, yeah. It's like, why are there so many alien movies and not so many Predator movies? Um, I actually wanted to bring up historical fiction, and this is coming from somebody, I don't read historical fiction, I'm not really interested in it, but in terms of historical biographies, um, and a lot of movies that capture this well, is think about if something was a big event that happened in the past, we all know about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think about Lincoln's assassination, for example, Martin Luther King's assassination. We all know kind of what happened. But I haven't seen the movie Lincoln, but I'm guessing if they're showing his life, they're going to show his assassination. And I'm guessing, again, I'm probably the wrong person to talk about this, but yeah. you still have to build that tension up because everyone knows about it. But I bet from the, the viewer's perspective, you're still going to feel it. And I think that that's important to do. My sister once told me about going to see Titanic in theaters mm -hmm. with a friend. Mm -hmm who started crying when people got onto the boat at the beginning. <laughs> because she knew most of these people are going to die. And the way that the movie used what we all knew going in, this ship is going to sink. The way that they ratcheted up tension was making us care about the people on the ship. Despite the fact yeah. that... They're Over half of them are going to die. die. I think mm -hmm. that's a really great skill, I mean, to kind of to build the characters. Well, the and the other thing, it was told in flashback, so it was a given. We knew it sank. He's putting out right out there yep. from the beginning. This ship went down. And then we have all kinds of people on Twitter saying, Titanic was a real real incident? I thought it was just a movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, knew, me to know it. <laughs> we, knew that, we knew from the flashbacks, which is another good point, that Rose was going to live. We didn't know the fate of anyone else on that boat because she was of an age and the way we were introduced to her um, was without anyone else around. So everyone in that movie. Everyone on that boat was fair game except her. And, and if you were a Titanic historian and you knew who went when. Yes. Yeah, yeah there were historical characters on the boat. Most yes. of the cast was real. Oh, okay. well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sadly, I actually watched that movie going, oh, you're so, oh, okay. So, yeah. Because you knew the people who were going to die. Don't my, ever <laughs> research Titanic <laughs> or see it. My ex-wife, <laughs> who dragged me to see the movie, the first time I didn't mind. The fifth time I was starting to really mind. Ooh, and, okay. No, my dad loved that movie. Life was I love that movie. <laughs> so anyway, you, I think you had your hand up. I don't. Well, I didn't, but okay. I <laughs> do want to say something, and that is, we were talking about methods for ratcheting up the tension yes, or increasing please. tension, and I would summarize them this way. First of all, we have foreshadowing, which Melanie brought up earlier, and that, of course, is giving hints as to mm -hmm. what is going to happen in the future. Red herrings, which gives hints, but they're incorrect hints. Then we go ahead to the flashback and the flash forward. Uh, best example I can think of of that 
in one one thing comes with the Christmas Carol when mm -hmm. poor old Scrooge has a dream mm -hmm. sequence in which he goes back in time and then he goes forward in time to witness his own death provided he goes on in the same way that he is currently going mm -hmm. so all of those are means of helping you get to the final resolution, which of course is where all tension should ultimately lead. Agreed. And there's also one thing of tension which we haven't mentioned yet, and I was waiting to see if you'd add it to your list, and that is when the plan goes wrong. When you... The twist? The twist. Your character is working... You get, Let's say you've got two characters you got that are it's working together, and one character is doing something and trying... Let's say disarming a bomb without anybody else knowing that it's being disarmed. And suddenly, the first character, who is supposed to be helping the second character, gets stopped or something, and he, he's got crucial knowledge. I can throw out a perfect example. I'm going to ask the right pack for their examples of some of the best suspenses that they have either read or seen mm. towards the end of this. So I'm tossing out to you guys. Everyone be thinking. And mm. when, I talk, when I give you my example, you'll understand why I'm holding back, because it's always the perfect example. Is there anything else, though, before we go to that five-minute Last, last suggestions that you have for tightening the tension technique wise or that you've either that you've done or that you've seen done that you like to do or well I was just going to refute what you just said about the twist because <laughs> that to me it says kaplunk ends the tension and now you depends have to start the, over it and perhaps is. even go higher than you were before yeah it's not the twist I, as, okay. soon, as soon as I say it and, and I'm trying to hold it back as soon as I say it you'll understand where I'm going with it's, it's the the wrench in the plan. It's the wrench in the plan. Yeah, the plan. Oh, it's so another it's, obstacle. It's another oh, type okay, of obstacle. I, I would just say, in ter my best tip I can say about um, building tension is just to make me care about mm -hmm. the characters. Because if I don't care, then it doesn't matter that there's a gun in the room. It doesn't matter that if the no. guy gets the girl or not. If the reader doesn't care about it, then it's unimportant. So make <coughs> the reader care about it. Yeah, Agreed. my favorite tension is always interpersonal tension, character tension. Write a character who feels real enough that I'm worried about not only their physical well-being, but their mental and emotional well-being. I'd say not only think about the character's tension, but also the scene's tension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's not just people who create tension. It can also be that strap on the bridge or the you know cable on the bridge that's about to break or whatever else it is but scene the scene can create the tension yeah i remember uh in english class being taught that climaxes should be surprising yet for inevitable lack, inevitable so the idea is present information that when they go back and reread it, it's like, oh, yeah, you did have all the pieces there. But don't make it so obvious that everyone is going to know. So plant, that's where red herrings are often used, so you don't know what information is important. But, you know, make sure that your climaxes don't just come out of nowhere, your tension, your whatever event. But, like, there is a solution if your person can, if your character, whatever, can just find it. And all the information that is there for find it, it's all the information for the reader is there to find it. But it's not extremely obvious. And if it's extremely obvious to absolutely everyone, I think you should go through and remove some information or hide it better. <laughs> I think it might be helpful for listeners to think about their favorite instances mm -hmm. of tension when they notice their heartbeat going up, when they were worried for an outcome or a character or um, in a story that they were either reading, writing, watching. Mm -hmm. um, notice how that tension was raised like pay attention to your body i've been told this so often lately and it's true when i notice my heartbeat going up or my voice getting louder or just my hands tensing things like that it's good to then stop and review what just happened in what i was reading or watching how did they do that because they've elicited a response a physical response. Tension's not just in your head. Mm -hmm. So notice what happens before that response comes up in you and take notes. Do you have any final? And then I'm going to ask everybody for an example of oh. your, favorite play, your favorite uses of tension. Go ahead. Well, I'll give you one of my favorite uses of tension, and it's a little short story by Jack London, mm. which is called To Build a Fire. Yes. And in it, the hero 
goes out in Alaska in 30 degree below weather. Hmm. And he's all full of himself because he's experienced. He knows Alaska. He can do this errand, whatever it is, which ultimately seems pretty unimportant. But then, ultimately, everything hinges on being able to strike one match. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think my favorite example of tension is um, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And it's near the end. This, I hope this isn't a spoiler. I hope by now people have read the book. I don't Harry know. Harry Potter spoiler! Harry Potter <laughs> spoiler! Um, but when Harry finds out that Vold Voldemort has to kill him, that's the only way that Voldemort can be destroyed. And Harry is walking into the woods toward Voldemort. And we all know that Voldemort is going to kill him. Harry knows that Voldemort is going to kill him. But he's walking anyway. And we see him walk through the woods. And to me, that was so tense. Um, to me, it was a really good example. Hmm. I can still see his family around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have a hard time deciding what my favorite tension is. My, my favorite feeling is when the, when tension is built to a successful finish. That's like my favorite ever. Um, an example of tension, man, um, I don't know. Uh, I'll bring up like. How about just a good example? Okay. Kathleen and I uh, watched It's a Wonderful Life not long ago. It was the first time Kathleen's ever seen it. it was You're really welcome good. to talk in my time if you want. It's really uh, good. But that's another example of a movie or a story that tells you what the ending is to start with, but still builds tension toward it. You really want to find out not only how George's wonderful life collapses, and the tension's built because we've seen everything that's built up to it. We know all the pressure he's under, and then when he takes uh, he takes credit for his, for Uncle Billy losing the money, and you know that he's going to go to jail, and he has to crawl to Mr. Potter, which is the one thing he's never wanted to do. You built the tension to a head, and then you want to see how how Clarence the Angel gets him out of it. That's something that we haven't talked about actually, but to do with emotional stakes. What would your character never ever do under any circumstances, but the most dire? build those circumstances. For for him, it was going to Mr. Potter, the, the town big bad, the money-grubbing guy who wants to have everything. Mm -hmm. And offering him the one thing that he had. It was like his... the George Bailey was the one thing that he couldn't buy, and he was like, I'm for sale. Yeah. It, it broke him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was beautifully done. Mm -hmm. And it built tension. <laughs> I know, if I had to throw out my favorite examples of tension, that's kind of a difficult one, I'm not going to lie. It is hard. It's but I example. would probably have to throw out Brian De Palma, who is an amazing Hollywood director who did films like Snake Eyes and Femme Fatale and a ton of others. Um, it's just the way he crafts his tension and suspense, uh, he does love the Hitchcockian model, um, but I'm a huge Brian De Palma fan, so I'd probably throw up any of his movies. Thank you for saying that. It gave me time to think. <laughs> um, yeah. I mentioned Grimm earlier, mm -hmm. and I realized one of my favorite episodes of Grimm is in season two, and it's full of tension, and it has the timing element built in and characterization. The premise is that um, the Grimm's partner, who is human and can't see these shifts really in other people who have beasts inside, he's reflecting on a case where someone said they saw a human being change into a monster. And it's an old case. The guy's on death row. He killed someone in cold blood who was unarmed. And this police detective is thinking, now that I know these things exist, what if that guy was telling the truth? What if he was fighting for his life against one of those things? And he and his partner, the Grimm, investigate. They reopen this case to see if they can figure out whether there really were monsters that this guy was fighting or not. And the guy's on death row. He's running out of time. They've got less than a week to figure this out. One of the bad guys, well, because they were monsters, one of these guys is dead, so they only have one lead that they have tracked down and they can't find him. And then they can't reach the DA when they find evidence that these people were creepy, creepy killer people. And it goes on and on. And the worst part for me was watching this person on death row get strapped down to a table and they started, they started killing him and there was still no call. You're watching back and forth as the detectives were trying to reach the DA, trying to get out of this hellhole, and this guy's 
dying. I'm anxious just hearing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just thought of something. This is a different type of tension, but um, which is why I brought it up. And I think I did this because of the reaction of the people around me. So I saw the first X Men movie, not X Men, X Files movie in the theater, opening night. So this was a movie theater full of X Files fans, which is very important. But there's a scene in the movie where Mulder and Scully look like they're about to kiss, but then there's this killer bee <laughs> or, or crawling on her. And we know, everyone in the audience just knows because of audience expectation, they're probably not going to kiss. Probably something's going to happen. And then the bee stings Scully. And then she falls unconscious and, you know, there. So it's like, and, and anyway, the moment that bee sting happened, the whole theater erupted in applause and cheering. <laughs> <laughs> so it was just a bit, that's a very different type of tension. Not only that, but anyone that wasn't an X-Files fan in that movie theater probably thought everybody was crazy. Yeah, really. I'm just trying to, I imagined when you said that, that they did kiss and it stung her and she passed out and he just thought he was that good. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was right before the kiss. It wouldn't it have been good at all if it had been during the kiss because the idea is they can never kiss. No, they that, get married eventually. Go ahead. You know, I don't think they actually get married, Next do they? Movie. Oh, Next movie. I didn't see them. I've stopped seeing they the movies. They were already married. Okay. In the next movie. Oh, I was just going to say that I've been looking for that lost train of thought, but I think that train left the station about <laughs> a half hour ago. Oh, no. Uh, the tension's sorted. Okay. The example that I took before about the wrench in the plan mm -hmm. came from a TV series that ran from 1966 to 1973. I'm watching Fedora because I'm hoping she catches on. But anyway, um, they did make movies out of it. With Tom Cruise, which the movies were okay, but they were not the same level Mission as the TV series. Mission Yay. Impossible. Barney was, which was the only black colored, whatever, whatever term you want to use, character. He was, a black was character. fantastic. He was an engineer. At, I believe he was an engineer. <laughs> it was his background. <clears throat> but they bad guys couldn't always see him, so he was in. <laughs> he, bad guys were not for because of a time period of television. They always had Barney running in the background, if you will, and he was like hidden underneath floors or whatever. He's working something, and suddenly something goes wrong with the plan, and he's stuck there, and he's got to get out. Now it wasn't always this character that this happened to, but usually nine times out of ten, you can <laughs> oh. bet. Poor Barney was going to be in a, in a situation. Stuck in the suitcase. Another one. Um, I feel like Barney was the writer's favorite character. <laughs> he was. He actually. He was. He was mine. He was mine. And just to make everybody happy, Leonard Nimoy was in as a main mm -hmm. actor in the series at one point. And Cinnamon provided the uh, oh, sexual, sexual tension, tension uh, oh, which was gosh. hilarious because Cinnamon, the Barbara Bain. Yes. And oh God, help me out. Was um, Cinnamon a hooker? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> She was an actress. The character was an actress who was a spy. Mission Impossible was nothing. It was a spy thriller. Peter Graves was a star. Is that Peter, what you're looking for? No, Peter Graves, he came like He came, he was my favorite of the leaders of the group. No, her real life husband who played Roland Hand. Don't remember. I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, there's another episode. I'm going to use it as a perfect example. Top Attention. I don't remember the name of the episode, but if you ever go back to watch these, and they are available on DVD and downloads and so forth. You're killing me with not telling me what's in the episode. <laughs> here, here it comes. Roland Hand is having to play a waiter. The situation is this. They're infiltrating a mafia dinner where business decisions are supposed to be being made. The goal of the whole FBI, the whole goal is to bring down this mob. Mm -hmm. Roland Hand is the only one who's allowed to go in to the dinner area, because he's supposedly deaf. He's not. He hears just as well as everybody at this table. One of the mob guys comes up to him, next to him, and instead of saying, boo, takes a pistol, shoots it in the air right next to his eardrum. Roland, does Roland Hand respond? How does he respond? What happens? And with that, I leave to the audience of Right Pack Radio <laughs> to go out and watch this. I will tell Kathleen when this is done, because oh, she's going to kill me. <laughs> Have a great week writing. Build some tension in your stories, and we'll catch you next week. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore.
STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry. Theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.